We're here today on the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And uh, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the history, why we have this day today, how did it come about? And while a lot of uh, the UN days and a lot of focus on uh, even uh, gender days has been there for 20, 30, 40 years, when it comes to the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, it was only 10 years ago that the Commission for uh, the Status of Women, the 55th Commission, uh, adopted this uh, report which spoke about the status of women and girls in science, the access that they have to resources, and also their participation in education and technology. This was only in 2011, 10 years ago. And in 2013, this was also something that the United Nations General Assembly, the UNGA, uh, noted that this is something that should be a priority. And they uh, affirmed their need for full and equal participation and access to science, technology and innovation for everybody, especially women and girls. Um, it was about six years, it's seven years ago now in 2015 that they started this day, that it was observed as a UN official UN day. And today on the 11th of Feb, we commemorate and uh, champion all our friends and women and girls in science. Even though we've done a lot in the last 10 years and we see in this room right now that there's quite a few women and women in science and girls in science with us, we still face a number of challenges. And one of those particularly difficult challenges is ability stereotypes. So it's the, how we feel about our own abilities as mathematicians, scientists, innovators, and also how the world sees us. Um, sometimes we see space, space discrimination based on our abilities in these, uh, in these domains, but also about representation. If there are not enough leaders in women in science, uh, everybody suffers. Um, we need to see these leaders in, uh, by ourselves to be able to uh, limit the impact of discriminatory norms, which is another problem that we continue to face. Uh, when it comes to pay parity and career progression, there's been, again, little progress. Um, it's hard for women to break into leadership roles in STEM because it still continues to be a male-dominated space. And even access to resources, whether to do scientific research or grants or to be able to reach a level of, uh, of uh, knowledge in science takes access to universities and schooling as well, even if there's passion and interest. What do we know about period poverty? We have a big problem and that is of access. So to resources, affordability of period products because of the taxes and because the typical period pro products available in the market can be too expensive for everybody. The second is menstrual crisis. It's a big crisis because there's not enough information and not enough resources, not just in terms of the sanitary products, but especially toilets. And I'm sure Professor Ramani can talk a lot about this as well. Uh, so I won't go into detail. And then the absence and support of families, as well as the lack of knowledge about managing periods. And finally, like Tanti said, it has extreme consequences for the dignity and rights of girls everywhere, whether it comes to their uh, future uh, progress, whether in their uh, working life, whether in their education, whether in their full and uh, equal participation in all spheres of life, in their dignity, and very importantly, in their health as well. Um, so, uh, we're going to be talking about the impact of menstruation on academic performance of high school students. And we're going to be focusing on our own school, which is UWC Maastricht, so United World College Maastricht here in the Netherlands. We did the survey, and uh, basically, it's mostly about uh, experiences on menstruation. And uh, since we sent it to students of our school, here you can see um, the answers that we got from the first question, which, which was about the age and the age at which students started their periods. Symptoms that people are experiencing while they're on their periods. And as you can imagine, and also probably from your own experience can tell, that these kind of symptoms are um, have a really broad impact on your daily lives, if, especially if you experience these, let's say, five days a month. Uh, many people said that 
PMS and our period symptoms have a negative effect on their academic performance. Uh, but in this question, it is also like we need to consider the fact that it, it can be very hard for people to identify whether their PMS and period symptoms have had an, like an impact on their academic performance. PMS or period symptoms are affecting in their academic performance. Mostly like uh, people are um, unmotivated to, their, to do their schoolwork or going to class and especially like going to, they, they can go to class but it's really difficult focusing on classes and if you skip, skip or like could not, cannot focusing on one class, they might, they have to like um, studied by themselves individually after the classes, like after the they're experiencing um, symptoms. So, which means it lets a really difficult time for the students. What kind of technology people are using while menstruating? So, university students are like about age of 19 to 23 and they are much aware about menstruation so uh, when we uh, did the survey we see that most of the youngsters are using pads they are not using menstrual cups there are only two percent is using tampons and uh, combination of menstrual cups and pads etc so with this data we can see that People lack awareness and as we see in the market, the use of menstrual cups is increasing. Its market is increasing. People are promoting it. So why we should use it and how we should use it is the main focus. But along with this, we should also know that if we are using menstrual cups, is it safe? Is it good for our uh, reproductive system? So with the awareness, it also comes about the information regarding the product, which the companies don't do. That's why people are mostly using pads because it is coming from a very long time and people are using it and people are trusting the brands and the other products related to the pads. Challenges which are faced by the university students during their periods. So most of them go through menstrual pain, heavy bleeding, premenstrual syndrome, clots, my menstrual migraine, and these are the different data. Like approx 50% go through heavy bleeding, missing periods, and premenstrual syndrome. This is because of various diseases which is uh, like increasing among girls. If we can see PCOD, PCOS, it's increasing. And we should talk about it and engage other girls as well to know more about it so that we can even have a treatment for it. Because what happens is that most of us believe that we are having a PCOS and we cannot fight against it. We see that it is a disease which is there in our body and it is normal. But we should fought, fight for it and we should treat it uh, in a way that we should not have any menstrual pain. Uh, Tide is a menstrual toolkit that you can see on screen, and it's comprised of reusable, menstru uh, reusable sanitary pads, underwear with a built-in gusset so that you can attach the sanitary pads, um, infographic instructions, and a handmade washer as well. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we made each of them and then how they work together. So, so the sanitary pad itself is made up of three main layers. Uh, the top layer is the dry layer that sits against skin. And we, saw, we found that that can be made from most knitted fabrics as it allows liquid to pass through while keeping it like feeling somewhat dry. The second layer or the middle layer is the absorbency layer. Um, and that's the layer that retains liquid and it can be made from most uh, natural materials. Um, and then the bottom layer, which should be made out of, it's, it's the leak proof layer. So it should be made out, out of most, I, th I think it can be made from pretty much anything that's leak proof um, and somewhat breathable. And the way it's designed is that when not in use, it can be closed, but when in use, um, the, the packaging that covers it is actually how you fasten it to underwear. So that's the pad. Um, we also built a handmade washer. Uh, what so, is bamboo fleece, please, just for clarification? Yeah, so the, the um, materials that we have on screen are materials that were accessible to us in testing. But really, we realized bamboo fleece is um, 
hard to get your hands on pretty much everywhere. So we said originally it should be made from bamboo fleece, but can be made from cotton, flannel, hemp, microfiber, any um, natural absorbent material that people can get their hands on. So the materials mentioned at the beginning are, are useful, but actually it can be made from, from kind of a range of materials, depending what you have available. And the, and the last layer is just any plastic or can you take a plastic bag and put it? Uh, you could. We would recommend something more similar to what an umbrella is made out of or a raincoat. Okay. So it's actually okay. like a, a sheer kind of flexible plastic, I suppose. Um, and then with the handheld washing device, this essentially works as like there's an inner cage in which you put your soiled either underwear or sanitary pads. And then there's a housing um, and a top opening. So you put water into it and use it just by shaking it up and down. We've been making these with, we 3D printed them at the time because we had access to 3D printers in our university. But I'll talk a little bit more about how that's kind of moved on because 3D printing again, isn't that accessible. Um, so these are the prototypes that we made to begin with. But how it all works together is, and I don't actually have any um, pads on me today to show you. But how it works is it all comes packaged inside of um, the washer or that's how you store it if you're using it yourself. The outer plastic layer, um, that kind of umbrella material, uh, it folds up and so it stays closed. So the part that you uh, sits against your skin is never opened or exposed when not in use. So you open it up and then with the top layer, you fold it under. And essentially in underwear, um, there's an extra layer of fabric or a gusset just kind of along the bottom that sits against your skin. And these that uh, uh, the opening of the pad slides into the gusset and you can just place it then. So it stays attached by kind of basically folding into your underwear. And when not in use, there's a tab to pull it back out, close it up. And um, we even kind of went as far as designing small pockets on the front of women's underwear so that you can carry them to and from the toilet in a more discreet fashion. Um, and then when you need to clean them, you put them inside of the um, washer, fill it with water, shake it out and rinse it. And you can do that a couple of times. And the other element, and it's related to the first presentations where you were pointing into how this is not only about the natural bleeding um, and protecting yourself of not getting dirt or, but it's also about all the hormonal changes that women go through. And I'm, I was amazed to read, and I learned this with time with also my colleagues at work, how much these hormonal changes affect the, the psyches of women and how much we make a huge effort to annul them. And this makes me think about the right of women and where where we are placing and how much we have advanced on this. We have advanced a lot. We are now in the market competing with men. We are trying to get the same positions. We are working at the same rhythm. Um, and we are annulling our, our differences. And one of the things that make us different is this period. This period that makes us feel tired, this period that people feel depressed, people that it's, it's just part of our nature and there is no space there's no space in the educational design to allow for those timing. We have sometimes a different uh, timing where we need our space to actually deal with nature. And this is part of nature. It's not something that we choose, it's nature. I have a colleague here at work that after years of feeling very sick, um, she got into a good doctor who did a hormonal test and she said, it's part of your period, it's part of your cycle. During this time, you cannot perform and you need X amount of hours to be lying on bed because your body is requesting this from you, a matter of awareness. And I know that this word already came into the conversation a number of times, but I find two types of awareness. One is the social awareness uh, that we all need to be more knowledgeable and understanding what this means and what this means in terms of, again, something that it's part of nature. And I'm sure that 
other uh, genders, they, they have other uh, specificities that you also we need to also contemplate. But in terms of menstruation, those who menstruate, we need to be able to have a social awareness of what this means and that we are all uh, working towards including this uh, natural element of our lives into our social uh, performance. And the other one is all the self-awareness. I've seen that in, into the, the the statistics that were presented, and Prachi finished the previous talk with this. It's amazing how uh, the diversity of problems that we have. And this is also I saw in the chat of my friends, uh, some of us, we never experienced pain. So for me, menstruation has been nothing. Like I, I've never experienced pain, so I could continue. And some others, they've, they lived it in such a um, drastic way and without any type of support. I have to ask you, how serious can the problems related to periods be, um, besides pain and all? Uh, actually, uh, in my experience, means I have been practicing for uh, say 20 years now. What I have experienced is, first thing uh, is uh, there is lots of ignorance about periods. Means... Uh, <clears throat> Like Akshata said, and uh, like uh, parents are not, parents, especially mothers, are not at all ready to talk to girls about it. For them, it's a taboo subject. And they come to us, they come to the doctors only when they are not able to conceive. That's one. Then if they are having uh, uh, severe pain but that too uh, rarely because uh, uh, mothers have told them that if you take um, medicines for this then maybe you are going to be infertile forever so no medicines for this and uh, pain you have to bear uh, it's a very taboo subject and uh, using uh, these uh, sanitary products which are not hygienic like uh, means most of them they are using uh, cloths they say they wash and reuse but how much this is uh, clean and all it gives rise to many diseases means what I have seen is if they are having a scanty flow scanty means uh, not a normal flow if uh, the bleeding is less they they, be, they may be will be going on using that same pad for three days they don't even change it uh, I have to ask you also have you seen any trends in help seeking have people become more aware or are these superstitions and stigma still very prevalent it's improving a bit now but I won't say because it's common even in the educated law not going out during periods not touching things if you uh, like I don't know whether you have heard about it if you touch pickle during um, menstruation that pickle will be spoiled oh, I see. yes it's very common so a female should not touch pickle during when she's menstruating Dr. Tenen so thanks again for your insights I wanted to ask you um, and especially since we also have uh, people who have some reach uh, with us today whether you could share with us what are some of the consequences of um, improper menstrual hygiene practices that you may have seen in patients and especially in young patients and, and how we could raise more awareness uh, and, and prevent uh, these things from happening? Yes, yeah, sure. First thing, what I as they have a myth that you're using medicines during periods may, give, may lead to infertility. Actually, their lack of hygiene gives rise to infertility because infection goes inside. Like I said, they're using that same piece of cloth for three days. So that infection is not going out anywhere. It uh, travels in the genitourinary tract and it's infected. I mean, they, are, they will come to know that they are infertile once they get married or maybe they, when they were, whenever they want to have children. So that they realize later on. And then um, uh, G, uh, this um, genital system infections, otherwise also, not only infertility, otherwise also, local infections, internal infections, and um, yes, not 
uh, I'll, I'll not say it's very common, but then um, there are chances of having carcinoma also when untreated. Thank you so much. And uh, I was also wondering, since they've been, uh, since these problems are becoming so widespread and also some other problem that a lot of people now are facing, such as hormonal issues, uh, like I think Akshita also mentioned PCOS, adenomyosis, endometriosis. So there's a range of healthcare issues that causes something that it was in the survey everywhere, period pain, right? I have two questions for you for that. Firstly, why is it that these issues come about? Does it have to do with menstrual hygiene and management? And secondly, what is the way that they can be managed? What is the best way to prevent them and to manage them? Um, Prachi, actually, there are two extreme um, ends of one spectrum. Having scanty flow and genital infections that is due to poor hygiene and PCOS like Akshata said PCOD is polycystic ovarian disease that is a hormonal disorder mm -hmm. that is more prevalent now because um, girls will not go for um, it's, they eat very unhealthy food uh, no exercise at all just sitting at home eating all the junk food and unnecess unnecessary stress they are taking they don't have to take so much stress just for smaller things so that stress affects the hormonal profile which gives rise to PCOS so that is maybe two levels of extremes in a spectrum one is lack of hygiene and the other end is this um, PCOD and um, that is uh, hormonal disturbances and they realize it when they have infertility it seems to me that uh, heavy bleeding you know at the end of the at the end of the age cycle okay uh, is is becoming more and more prevalent so much so that hysterectomy is uh, or is becoming almost routine I, is it so or is it my imagination and are there any reasons why this is happening yes ma'am that's a very good question because there are two things uh, heavy bleeding uh, at the end of menstruation is a very common problem because again now there are hormonal disturbances uh, we are uh, as you said hysterectomies are becoming more common because the things are diagnosed early one thing second thing is no one is ready to wait for things to slow down <laughs> or naturally you just want to get over with <laughs> right so like we advise them that this is very common like when there is uh, there's a term minaki that when the when the girl starts her period that is minaki m e n a r c h e even that time there are hormonal disturbances because body has just started the cycle so so many girls they come with a heavy flow for days together then no periods at all for maybe two three days so that is a that is body is trying to adapt to it and same happens when there is menopause when body is like trying to go away from it but then these are hormone disturbances and you have to sometimes bear it i'm not saying that if you are bleeding heavily then you should just bear with it but then there are medicines and you can uh, like this see but no one is ready to wait now.